you see that, Nick? That's how close we are. And they can't pull us apart and they can't force us apart. Because we're together. I don't know who you are. Don't say that, honey. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowling. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just to note, whether that film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include potential spoilers and explicit plot details. We are at episode 125, Back to Cole's Choice, and there's not a lot riding on this selection, (laughs) right? There's not everything riding on doing a good job for this one. You feel some pressure about this one? A little bit. Well, let me tell everyone what it is, and then we'll talk about that. We are going to talk about A Woman Under the Influence from 1974. That's written and directed by John Cassavetes, and it stars Jenna Rollins, Peter Falk, and a lot of Cassavetes' repertory company, folks like Fred Draper and John Finnegan, in addition to Cassavetes and Roland's mothers. Talk about no pressure. It's about a woman whose unusual behavior leads her husband to have her committed to a mental institution for six months. And it's not just a pivotal film for me, it was one of the first batch of 50 that was selected for preservation by the National Film Registry. Now this pressure you're talking about, it has taken almost five years of doing this show for me to build up to this. And even now, I'm not entirely convinced that I should be talking about it. I was already a burnout husk just watching the DVD menu on a loop. It cut so deep. This is such a personal film for me. I'll try to rein myself in for this one, but this may be a little longer than usual episode. It really is the film that showed me what was truly possible with film for the first time. I had always loved movies, And I understood the enduring appeal and power of certain milestone films, but none of them felt like they had my name written on it the way this one does. And it's not just this film, but John Cassavetes is very important to you. Maybe the most important filmmaker to me in terms of how I personally connect to everything he does. Well, practically everything. Do you remember how you first came to his films? Strangely enough, I came to them through reading first before I saw any of his work. Uh, I say any of his work. I was familiar with him as an actor. I'd seen The Dirty Dozen. But at that point, I probably hadn't delved that deeply into the American independent cinema to realize how important he was to that. So, And this was pre-internet, so it was books, not articles or lists. I know you love to leap off of a list and go exploring, but I didn't have that option. So instead, it was from going to the library. So then, why Cassavetes? What spoke to you in his work? One, he gives us complete permission to examine and indulge in those parts of ourselves that are completely out of control. And two, as ill-advised and unrecognizable as it sometimes is, everything that he puts on screen is about love. Deep, uncompromising, struggling, eternal love. And speaking of love, before I say anything else, I want to say how much I love Jenna Rollins and how I want to make it absolutely clear. I think she gives the greatest performance here that I have ever seen an actor give. No exceptions. I'd put her up against anyone. And it's almost a shame because it overshadows Peter Falk a little bit, and he's also giving a career best. It's an incredible tightrope to walk. This would be so easy to overdo or to slip into caricature if you're not careful. Richard Brody, he described it as a seemingly endless well of pain and endurance. And I absolutely agree with the latter of those two things being the more important part to me. What do you think of Brody's assessment of that? I wholeheartedly agree because I think you can see that in that love again. So many of these folks are trying to get love, give love, and they're bad at both ends of those spectrums, but they keep going. And can we also say, as an audience member, you have to have some endurance, too? Oh, without a doubt. This really puts you to the ringer, which is why it's taken me five years to talk about it. As it begins, this is a very masculine world that 
Falk lives in with his job, with his co-workers. And Cassavetes, he is searching the faces of these men with the camera as Falk is fighting with the head office on the phone, yelling about having this unbreakable date with his wife. Now, does it feel a little bit like this might have been an uncommon sentiment then? Something that might be seen as soft or something that characters would have stereotypically been mocked for? For me, it works to put it in a certain time, and it doesn't feel stereotyped as much as specific. And separate, I think, is the biggest issue. Because it seems like the characters are very much playing the roles that they are expected to play. And by that, I mean woman, man, husband, wife, mother, father, whatever it is. And they're typed by those roles. So do you think the story would be told differently today in terms of those roles that people play? Uh, in some ways it might, just because of the way cultural standards evolve over time. But I think there's a subversion that's happening here, of course, because it's Cassavetes. In a lot of ways, I think it's his uncommon sensitivity as a writer that makes the difference with all of that stuff, because he never takes the easy way out with anything. These characters that might have been louts in another movie don't resort to that sort of behavior, so there's not as much to update. You see them as being confined within a certain type, but they too are sort of pushing against that and rebelling against that expectation. Even the stock construction worker in Cassavetti's universe is a real and complex human being. And as far as Mabel and Nick, I think it's exactly what you said first. It's a situation that's unique to these characters. It's specific. Maybe not so much beholden to the time that it takes place in. It does operate within those structures on a surface level, though. Because at the beginning, you have Nick and his burly crew splitting time in the opening with Mabel and her mother who are concerned with corralling and caring for the kids, tasks that are traditionally thought of as the domain of women in this particular social structure. But there are those things that Cassavetes is doing. The mother has absolutely no faith in her daughter, you can see in her face. So this doesn't have anything to do with the traditional passing down of these roles. You can feel how Mabel wants to do everything just right, but she is not going to be able to. I think also why this may feel unexpected, especially at that time and really still today, is that idea of loudish behavior, as you sort of mentioned. Because we typically think of those kinds of characters as not being able to express themselves. But in Cassavetti's films, that's all anybody does all the time. But it doesn't serve to make them more easily comprehended or empathized with. And I do think that there's also more of a timeless quality here because I still see wives basically waiting at home for their husbands and having those separate tracks so that each place that they inhabit becomes its own sort of prison. Since that's so far away from how we live our lives together, is there anything about that that keeps you from understanding or getting to the core of what this is all about? I don't think so. I guess at this point, maybe I've seen enough movies to understand other behavior than my own. But I now interact with a lot of different people all the time. And it really does seem that some people are still caught up in having to explain the behavior of the people around them, the ones that they love most, to other people without being able to explain why they do things themselves, what those constant old reasons are. You mean as in to excuse it? Yes, or cover up for it, or condone it, or condemn it, a lot of times in this case. It's the same for me in the sense that there is not a moment of this that does not feel real to me, as highly wrought as it is. And this is not the kind of life that you led as a kid. No. One of the things I'm picking up on that I think I had no experience with, still don't exactly, is that both Mabel and Nick are so anxious about the prospect of this evening together. It's supposed to be a love night, is the way he describes it. And that feels like a giveaway about his maturity level and that thing you were saying earlier about his ability, or in this case, inability to express himself well. He talks about it almost like a child when he uses that language. And then he's ultimately disappointed when he has let her down. He's broken his promise to her. And in the course of these conversations, he ends up defending her in a way that tells us that he likely does this a lot too. He insists that she's not crazy, but no one said she was. In fact, she's definitely not. 
he's simply not emotionally or intellectually equipped to understand her problems. That doesn't mean he's callous or uncaring. I think he loves her very much, so much that it hurts him to see these things happen. It's absolutely genuine. He just doesn't know how to handle any of it either. How much of what you think he does is self-fulfilling prophecy? How much of what he does turns her into what he fears? I guess it's what I think about when I watch this film, which is that Cassavetti sets this, that this is not the first time any of this is occurring, and this will not be the last time it's occurring either. And I was thinking about every time he asks her, are you okay? I wonder, how many times a day does he have to do this because she's not okay, or he's made her not okay? I'm just so filled with dread watching them both try to anticipate everything and manage everything. It just cannot seem to go right. But he's the one who invokes that word, crazy. And that is a big word. That is a fraught word. Well, we get to assess a little bit of it without his interference immediately after this because we get a glimpse of her rituals that she goes through when she's alone. The things that occupy her mind, the way she feels like she is orchestrating this empty house, pointing at the corners, maybe counting in her head. I'm not exactly sure what she is saying to herself, but this is all without Nick's bombast. This is what she does on her own time. How did that affect you seeing what she was doing? Even just you repeating it back now makes me anxious because I have an idea of what she's saying, which is that thing is over there, whatever this thing is. I have to make sure that I don't move it because if I do, it will set a chain reaction that will end in something terrible. Or, okay, still the right number of things. Or, I know this thing is right here. I have to move slightly around here in order to get there without running into it. Nothing so positive, or at least that could be positively spun as, I want to have everything just right before our date. No. It's more like, I have to have everything mm, just okay. right before our date. Well, it also put me in mind a little bit of a couple of conversations that we've just been having on the show one about dearest sister, how Anna couldn't trust her senses or her faculties. And then on a recent Patreon episode, we were talking about the movie Smithereens and how the character Wren is wary of this quiet time, this kind of space for reflection, and all of those things that she thinks about when she's not in constant motion. Because why do you want all the voices to get loose? And some of that space she fills up with music. Like the opening, the music that she listens to, it's sort of high-minded and grandiose. And this comes up a couple of times. The soundtrack, it will employ an operatic backdrop with something like these guys toiling in a ditch and then piling in the back of a truck to go to a bar. One of Nick's co-workers actually sings opera at the table later. And I think the way it works for me is that it really suits her heightened emotional state on one level, but maybe not exactly on all the rest. It's another element that makes me feel that uncomfortable friction in my brain that I think Cassavetes is going for all the time. As for the score itself, Bo Harwood, who's another longtime collaborator of Cassavetes, his piano, at times it is almost emotionally too much for me. It's extremely effective. It's not quite as crushing as his song, Rainy Fields of Frost and Magic in Killing of a Chinese Bookie, but it's damn close. And that's a super high bar because that is maybe one of my 10 favorite songs that I've ever heard. How did you like the music? How did it affect you? I'm so glad you mentioned that about her heightened emotional state because I hadn't thought of it that way. But now that I am, it seems like opera makes a ton of sense in another respect. Because if you actually look at the book for an opera, it's relatively simple words, but it's all about meaning and nuance and inflection, pitch, volume to get the point across. So maybe if they sang to each other, they could be better understood somehow. But they're screaming at the top of their lungs most of the time, and it just doesn't get across. Well, he does break the date, unfortunately. He has to. And Mabel is left to her own devices when he stands her up, and she goes out to a bar and ends up picking up a guy. This scene, when she says, I know, when the stranger tries to tell her his name, that's the first moment that I realized when I was watching this the first time how incredible she is. She leaves with the guy, she brings him home, but none of this is going the way that he thinks that it was going to. As you're watching this, I'm sure the dread is there, but do you feel like this is her revenge for being stood up? 
I don't know about revenge because she's in such bad shape. It's self-inflicted more than anything else. Hurting herself. Because Nick's not there to see any of it. Maybe I should rephrase the question. The reason I say it that way is based on the fact that this is a very conscious decision that I feel like she makes. That she could have gone anywhere to blow off steam. I reiterate, she is not crazy. She's able to distinguish between right and wrong. I don't know. I still have a really tenuous handle on that. I know what Cassavetes has said, that she's not crazy. It's way more about frustration and about these roles that they're having to play, but it really does seem like something unconscious is happening. That chemically, something is going on here that's driving her in a manner that she doesn't fully understand and also doesn't necessarily remember. But that could also be a coping thing. Mm. I don't know is what I'm trying to say. One of the elements that I like most about it is that I appreciate the potential conflict of Nick coming home to discover this. It is studiously avoided. It's too obvious. It's too lazy a move for Cassavetes. So maybe that undercuts what I'm asking. Because if she really wanted it to be revenge, she would have made sure that they ran into each other. But instead, the guy gets out just before Nick brings the whole crew home for breakfast. And I assume that this is something that Cassavetes would easily do himself. These spaghetti dinners, they were a family slash crew thing for them. And the production of this actually is really interesting. I don't want to get into a whole lot of anecdotes or tangents because it's already such a huge discussion, but I do find the production interesting. It was an unsalaried production, and he used a ton of students that were just looking to get professional experience or to work with Cassavetes specifically. And then there were some professionals and it all came from the AFI where he was the first ever filmmaker in residence. But back to the dinner or breakfast in this case, this response is what I was saying earlier about these guys not being chauvinist stock characters. I feel like they are aware of Mabel and her tendencies, either as they've observed them or they've been described to them and they even love her. Everything is family with all the complications that that entails. Because don't you think, and at least I think that's what the script is showing us, that these people are real people and so they have their own history. There had to be a Mabel in their family at some point. Right. So they carry around that remembrance of what Nick goes through all the time. He's obviously always wary of having to manage her, especially around people. And so you've got text, subtext, and metatext when you consider Cassavetti's method about frequently dealing with this question of the status quo and whether there is any value in maintaining it. Spoiler alert for every waking moment, there isn't. And he captures all of this because there are cameras in every nook and cranny. They're searching and they're probing. Does it feel in technique more to you like a narrative feature or a documentary? Because it looks and feels as much like Grey Gardens as it does Kramer versus Kramer, for example, right? Yeah, I think you're on the money. There's so much realism happening that you assume, oh, they just turned the camera on inside of this household and said, just do what you normally do. So how does that technique affect what you feel as you're going through it? It makes me want to run away. <laughs> <laughs> far, far away. And it also makes me feel that there's just too many people there are too many things. There's too much happening all the time and everyone's too close. Claustrophobic. Yes. And I think again about what you were saying earlier, this whole self-fulfilling thing that Nick is doing. He's the one raising our anxiety level. Assuming something is going to happen or more likely assuming that someone is going to have a problem with whatever Mabel is going to do. I think that one way it affects me technically, aside from telling the story, since I've seen it so many times, I can relax into it. Well, relax into it and <laughs> look for other things. And as much as I like to point to Cassavetes as a defining creative force, all of this really underlines for me the benefit of collaboration. It makes me understand just how much everyone's individual contribution seems to be so indispensable. And then we have to talk specifically about Cassavetes and Roland's collaboration in particular. It spills over every boundary. She frequently said it was hard to live with him, but not because of the reasons that you might expect with regard to all this raw nerve emotional tumult, but because there was nothing that she might say that he wouldn't then write down for later use. 
Well, it was Roger Ebert who pointed out, and I think this is absolutely right, that it's Jenna Rollins who is always playing the Cassavetes character in all of these films. And it's amazing to watch this process that he distilled down into the most important collaboration being the two of them. And we know that he wrote this for her, and it made me think a lot about where she was in her life, because I am seeing her as a real person, because she is amazing. This is her talent, letting me do this. And it's fascinating to see that, at this point, she and John Cassavetes had been married for about 20 years, which is a very long time. All four of their children had been born at this point, so she's a mother of four. Oftentimes, it would be her really carrying the financial weight of the family. She was in her second decade of acting as well. The oldest child was about 15, the youngest still in preschool. Well, I think you've answered this question about where she was in her life a lot better than I actually could. I just think that, obviously, living with him and the children and the money and work, I'm sure life was full of frustrations in some ways, but she seems so utterly fearless. Like those things just don't matter, ultimately. And I admire her so much for that. She has that quality of knowing that it's up to me. It radiates out of her. It's not enough to be in the right place at the right time. You also have to take that chance when it's offered to you. And that's how I have always thought of her. And when she was young, she didn't want kids. She didn't want to be married. Sometimes you meet the one, though, and we can be pretty persuasive. Minus the kids, though. <laughs> right. And then they found themselves struggling side by side together. At this point, like you say, they had been married for about 20 years. Can you imagine how much we'll know about each other after that much time? It's crazy for me to look at myself and you now, and I'm roughly her age in this movie. So we don't have all of those decades together. So the road ahead feels even more important somehow. There was all of these years that I had to learn some things, but then my biggest learning experience has been married to you. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit more about this spaghetti breakfast scene. So much is happening, specifically in reaction shots or glimpses more accurately. I love watching Falk react to the actors off screen that might be reacting to Mabel. Do you think that she makes some of the others nervous too, or is it that they're just as much generally anxious about Nick's reaction to anything that she might innocently do? I do think it is more the latter. I mean, it might be unusual for sure to be invited to dance in the middle of a breakfast, but it seems like those sideways eyes are trying to get a sense of what Nick is feeling and watching his shoulders start to rise, instead of thinking that she's doing something that's out of bounds. There's a brilliant bit of framing while all of this is going on, where we get just a glimpse of Mabel on the left side of the frame, and I think you can really see how tortured she is for just a moment. She almost seems on the verge of tears with all this effort and stimulation. Cassavetti's close-ups look and work so differently from everyone else's. He makes virtually all the rest look like cheap shorthand because he communicates so much with his in a very specific way. You've seen a few of his major works now. How recognizable is his style to you at this point? Before you mentioned that about the close-ups, I hadn't thought about it. And I guess it comes down to the content, the scripting itself, that is the hallmark of his films. I haven't noticed the technical aspects of it. I'm probably just sweating so hard and waiting to find out what's going to happen next rather than, like you said, watching something so many times that I get to notice those other things. But in terms of feel, things that aren't necessarily on the page, when you think about the killing of a Chinese bookie or opening night and then this, is there a uniformity that you feel like, oh, this is a Cassavetes vibe? I guess it's that idea of never looking away from something. Mm. I've talked in the past about I sometimes get a bit angry or frustrated with directors who are looking at something when I want to be looking at something else, and when I don't feel that there's a specific choice or decision around that. And so this gives me all of the information, knowing that the characters don't have that same information. Well, obviously, at any gathering of theirs, there's always going to be a point at which it tips over the edge. Every party or dinner that they've ever had probably ends with some version of this. His mother calls, the party's over, 
And then there's this heartbreaking note after the commotion dies down where she's pleading her case to him and she tells him, I can do anything. Do you feel like I do in that this is exactly equal parts true and untrue or maybe more accurately, it's true up to a point? How would you classify it? I think all of us, if we concentrate enough or the stakes are high enough that yes, we could force ourselves to do something, but it could never ever last. I think she would physically break apart. I think she would explode if that had to happen. We see a little bit of that at the end, actually. We do. I was going to say, I think that's what she's trying to do. She's just waiting for that right word that's going to make sense in her head and she'll do the thing that he wants. So the effort of trying to do it is breaking her apart. I have to admit that this is a bit of an anomaly, my love for this character. I don't typically respond to neediness on this level very positively, but maybe that's not the right word. Would you describe it as something else? Because she does have her own frustrations and wants and loneliness. I guess the word that comes to mind more than neediness is maybe dysfunction. Truly dysfunction. They still are able to navigate through the world, but at these physical and emotional, mental bruises that come up because of it. And I don't want to speak for you, but I think you have a harder time with people who can't necessarily navigate or do better than you want them to do. That's true. It's one of my frustrations when I observe that sort of thing. And while I'm thinking about it, actually, I feel like it's basic needs that aren't being met. For example, the layout of the house itself. I think it contributes to everyone's madness. She doesn't have a space of her own, but none of them do. They're sleeping in the dining room. There's that private sign on the bathroom door that doesn't mean a thing. It would drive me crazy. Even down to all of the kids sleeping in one room together. And I think it is important that Mabel has no space of her own, but it's equally important for Nick because it means that this outside world that he has access to that she doesn't in the same way, he still has to act a certain way when he's in it. So nobody has anywhere to go. And the house itself doesn't seem to be designed for comfort and kind of letting down of your burdens. The first thing that you see when you walk in is that heavy sort of passageway or front room with that dark, dark, heavy wood. Yeah, that piece of furniture that he sits on while he's making these phone calls, for instance, it almost feels like it came straight out of a church. It's rigid and upright and forbidding. There's nothing comfortable about it. You don't see the presence of a family when you get in. It's these appearances more than anything. So, of course, some of that is offset when Mabel actually gets to get outside. We see her waiting for the school bus to come to pick up the kids. And I love how joyful that she is when it arrives. Almost in a way that is just your standard, oh, mom, you're so embarrassing way for the kids when they're getting off. Her kids are so important to her. She thinks of them as the only good thing she's ever done. And it's really heart-wrenching when she is asking them for their assessment of her. One of them says, you're nervous, mm -hmm. too, in addition to being wonderful. But it's pretty heartbreaking when your kids also know that something isn't quite right. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask just now, actually. What must the house rules be? I can't imagine there are any, except for the ones that Nick implements in that moment and no other time. How can they even grasp a fraction of what is happening here? But it's not all grim. There are some really fun moments here, too. She's very funny. The film is funny. It's a funny movie, as yeah. Peter Falk said. And that often involves the children. Her reactions are funny. Sometimes the most inappropriate ones are the funniest. And of all the comedy in it, I don't feel like it's pitiful when those things are happening. Did it feel the same to you, or did you have an undercurrent of feeling sorry for her when this stuff is happening? I'm going to answer that in a slightly different way because I do feel sorry for her from start to finish, but not specifically in those moments. I'm so just rooting for her to be identified finally and managed and cared for. So I feel like I'm on her side the whole time. Even though you feel some management is necessary? I do. I really do. Even self-management. That's probably actually the okay. most important aspect of that. So I do feel like there's just so much strength inside of her. That's a good thing. I think I generally feel like you. I think it's more a case of being misunderstood. 
We see that when she's trying to get Mr. Jensen to dance Swan Lake with the kids and instructing them to die, and he's just a big stiff because he won't get into it. They're just trying to have fun. She's not hurting anyone. But Nick calls, and she relates this story to him, and he hangs up as soon as she gives her account of what's happened through the day. And she blames the phone for cutting out, but she knows that he hung up, and she knows that she blew it, and you can see for just a moment that she is afraid of what is coming next. This feels like the moment that we're not getting let off the hook, like we did when she had the man home and Nick came home after that, so there wasn't a meeting. This is everything descending into her world at the worst possible moment. And Jensen tries to talk to Nick when he arrives. He's trying to somewhat calmly, rationally explain his apprehension about leaving his kids with this woman, but Nick won't have any part of it. He can only express anger. He hits her for the first time. He has to know that there's always the potential to come home to this or something potentially worse. That is a lot of stress to be carrying around every moment that you're away from home. What do you think that he's mad at specifically? Does he even know? Could he articulate why he's so angry? No, because his mother is there too, making everything worse, interfering. He has that tool of his, which is that control, this time through physical violence. And he uses that line that we've heard a lot of times in our lives, see what you made me do. And for him, I think it makes sense, at least in terms of his pathology, that this is all coming from her. If she could just stop, it wouldn't have to be like this. That I, meaning Nick, would not have to be like this. In this pathology, I think we both feel the same about this. Nick he is always trying to do the right thing, but he always chooses the wrong thing. He's not any better than Mabel on that score, probably far worse. In general, I think she's just far more perceptive and intelligent. When they are waiting for the doctor to come to commit her, unbeknownst to her, she hits the nail on the head with her assessment of things as they are. You got embarrassed and you made a jerk of yourself. You feel bad about hitting me. Her acumen all the time is formidable. She's right about all of these people. Jensen is a stuffed shirt. He is very uptight. And then she does this thing, which I think is brilliant. She invokes their wedding vows. Do you imagine that their lives have changed a great deal in the years leading up to this? Is he remembering a different Mabel altogether when he looks at her? I don't know. I don't like to think that that old maxim is true, that one about the thing that you fell in love with is the thing that ultimately will drive you crazy. I think I sort of got the paraphrasing right on that one. But it does seem like there had to be some sort of an optimistic haze, if nothing else. Because she is so wonderful and exciting and funny and loving. So all of that had to be there. But I guess he didn't think about what he was going to have to do over the years in terms of evolving himself or understanding the darker side of those personality traits that he loves in her. Maybe it's that idea, too, that a lot of us are willing to work, but maybe not always that hard or at the moment that we need to work that hard. I think she's more willing to work than he is. Maybe more equipped to work, I should say. Because she is crystal clear in her understanding of motivation and his failings. And I think it's this quality of the character and the film at large, that's what helps me process the neediness. It's not just her that's off. She also serves as that mirror that softly reflects everyone else's foibles. And so she's not grasping or reliant because of what she needs when it comes down to it. I think that's where I am making this distinction. She desperately wants to be self-reliant. I think that she has another quality that I personally really like and think it's important, especially in a marriage, which is that she is willing to let him off the hook and she'll let a lot of the characters off the hook when maybe she should hold their feet to the fire a bit more often. But would they take her seriously if she tried to do that is the question, I guess. Because they believe that she is crazy, just straightforwardly crazy. For us though, as the viewer, does it matter whether she is ill or with what? And just to drill down into that a bit, does there have to be a specific pathology with whatever this illness is? For example, do we have to say that she's bipolar? 
For me, it doesn't matter one bit in terms of how effective the film is. Specificity wouldn't improve the story on that count. All we need to know is that she is not the only one that has issues, but her issues are of a particular brand that single her out for mistreatment and isolation. As long as we can recognize that she more or less has it together as anybody else, then that does the job. I ask that here because I do struggle with the performance a bit. I'm not disputing possibly the greatest performance on screen, but it's the mannerisms that Mabel displays that I struggle with. I'm very drawn to her words. Mm -hmm. But the tics you find distracting, maybe if you don't know exactly the ailment or condition she's trying to portray? Yes, because it can start to feel like it's almost a caricature of somebody being crazy. So then, when I kind of start to go down that rabbit hole of bipolar behavior, especially when people are in manic phases, it seems like the absolute truth, at least Mabel's truth, because that's what Cassavetes is always going for, truth. And we mentioned this earlier, he talked about not thinking that Mabel was crazy. He didn't do any sort of research into mental illness. He said, I'm half crazy myself. And I think almost everyone is verging on some kind of insanity. And that this all comes down to having no place to put a person's emotions, especially women who have been married for a long time. And I would say also keeping it in that time frame too. You mean the early 70s? Yes. So if I come back again to this question of truth... And what is he trying to say here? And if she's playing his part, does that mean that maybe he's also possibly undiagnosed bipolar? I don't truly know the answer. Though if I do keep on that path, the characterization does not break down for me. But more than anything, whenever she speaks, that's when I feel like I'm truly seeing the character. Based on what I've read, I've read a fair amount of stuff about him. I would say it falls more in the realm of maybe narcissistic disorder than anything. There was a real Jekyll and Hyde about his behavior as much as I love him that depended on how much he needed you for something. Oh, I didn't realize any of that. You should flip through Cassavetes on Cassavetes that we have in here on the shelf. You'll begin to see some of these patterns emerge. But in terms of the character in this story, no, I don't need anything so specific. Do you have any issue with the mannerisms? No, I feel like she's developed them over the course of a lot of workshopping, I don't think any of it's too much. It's her face that does me in. For instance, when I was going slowly through the scene that we did for the opening scene of this, I was looking at it almost a frame at a time. Just the emotions that are flitting across her face. She's not doing anything huge. She's not moving her body very much. But her face is often like this rictus roller coaster, almost. Watching it a frame at a time, it feels almost comically exaggerated, but then when it's in motion, it is on the money. Yeah, by the way, thanks for giving me a super easy scene to play. <laughs> You're welcome. You did a great job with it, I thought. <laughs> thanks. Probably not enough to keep you out of the asylum, obviously, because the doctor arrives here, and then she's afraid, and then defiant. There's another great shot here with the blood on the towel in the margin of the frame. Nick's mother is there, like you said, and she is just as out of control as Mabel, so it is exactly that thing that you mentioned. No one is their best, sanest self here. Oh, and when she starts bargaining to get to stay in the house and it occurs to her that the kids can't go with her if they send her away, her helplessness and pleading, it ties my guts in a knot. Yeah, thanks again. <laughs> I got through 44 years without this movie. And this is not a short film. It's over two hours. But it manages to do something crazy. So we've gone through a lot to get to this excruciating point. But it doesn't feel like a slog in terms of time. It felt like five minutes have gone by since then, but somehow 50 years. I don't know if that makes any sense. I don't know how the film manages this. Because chaos always feels like it's going fast. And this is chaos. The kids are in the middle of this fight. And then we have this cut as the doctor is reading the committal document. It's the type of thing that more traditional audiences found so frustrating about Cassavetes. What was your gut reaction to that cut? It kind of felt like the end of the world to me. It's just the lights going out. I think actually Marianne Faithful said that. That's what her young child likened the experience when she was taken away because of her drug problem. 
that it was like the lights went out. And it is pretty jarring, too, because there's no act, structure, something to say, oh, that's the end of this and the beginning of this thing. Well, in the aftermath, Mabel is all anyone wants to talk about at work. Nick is distracted and angry, and then there's this work-related accident. He takes the kids on this hilariously grim trip to the beach. He is a mess without her. Always aiming for this prescribed notion of happiness and contentment that I think is unreal and unreachable for this family. He's apologizing to the kids for sending her away. As unstable as Mabel may be sometimes, they don't seem like they will survive as a family unit without her. And to go back to a question that we were talking about earlier about gender roles and sexual politics, it comes into play here in the most overt ways, I think, right? Because he's not judged nearly as harshly by the culture at large for being equally poorly suited to raise these children in his own way. That's just expected of dad in 1974. He's just as unstable, just in a way that is more socially acceptable at that time, at this time. How much do you feel like any of that has changed? Only slightly. If at all, probably for most people. Because I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. I so often see mom is the caretaker, dad is a babysitter somehow instead of a parent. And that's not how I grew up. Mm. I guess maybe my dad was ahead of his time too. He was very much in my life all the time. It was never, okay, dad's going to watch me while mom goes to do something. I was really with my dad a lot. So compared to your dad, Nick is completely ineffectual, or compared to a lot of people probably. But does everything flow from that source? Is that his greatest sin? Or is it more egregious that he just doesn't see her as a whole person? Is that his fault? Is that what he has been taught? And then what's hers? Just that she's socially inept? Is that the worst thing about her? Wrong place, wrong time for everybody. Playing these old tapes again, as I mentioned. Their mothers not letting them get out of that space in order to be somebody else. And then immediately having a family that you're responsible for when you haven't quite taken the reins for yourself. I don't see him as having sinister motives at any point. But this idea of not being able to learn and grow in a way that's beneficial for somebody other than yourself, but starting with yourself. And so Mabel suffers the most for it, for everyone's inability to deal with it. Six months later, we learned she is now returning from the hospital. How do you feel about the decision to leave any aspect of her hospitalization off screen? I felt like that was calculated drama because when she is then later in her own words explaining matter of factly what happened, nobody can handle it. And we see it in every single aspect of her appearance. She looks like a different person, but specifically, she looks like a doll dressed up to prove that she's sane and correct. I think in addition to all of those things that you're saying, the impact the withholding makes is huge. I feel her absence profoundly because of that. I am never not thinking about her when she's not on screen. I also really like the detail of when we first see her, we don't hear or see her words and looks with Nick. It's very removed and I think completely set up for disaster. It's that long, rainy walk. And she's barely speaking. She's already crying. It's just so overwhelming and everyone is so close into her. No one is saying the right thing. And they're asking her all of these questions, but they don't know what's happened to her. They can only see the aftermath. So do you think the story would be different would be told differently if she had been clearly diagnosed with something and treated accordingly. I'm going to go back again to bipolar disorder. When I think about it, I am more inclined to think it would still occur almost in the same fashion if they made it today, but there would be more overt issues of class in it. It would be virtually the same, but in this case, in the modern version, because she couldn't afford to avail herself of help. And then we've seen cases that are just as or more acute in films that are more recent. Todd Haynes' Safe comes to mind, although that's been 20 years now, too. I thought of Two Days, One Night, mm. again, a lot through this. We covered that back in episode 63, if anybody wants to check that out. And that is very specifically about depression, even though the nature of that depression we don't quite understand. We're not told about it. 
And it's got some extreme manifestations of suicidal depression as well. The other thing that that film made me think of here is the toll the illness takes on the partner. Though in Two Days, One Night, Manu is the most expressive and supportive and steady person that you would want to have in that position. But you can still see that same fear and sadness and frustration like you can in Nick. It's just less aggressive. And so the house is full and everyone is all dressed up and excited. It's a homecoming party for Mabel. This is maybe the single worst idea he has ever had and doesn't realize it until it's too late. How in the world did no one tell him not to do this leading up to this? Was this a surprise for everyone? I think somebody said something. I really do. I just don't think he heard it. Well, anticipating her arrival to this is torturous. She finally arrives, and it is every bit as harrowing as you would anticipate, especially when she is interacting with the kids for the first time after six months. She has to ask permission to see them, and he doesn't respond. It's finally his mother that she has to ask. Not only does she have to ask permission, but she has to keep a lid on everything. She is in such pain and distress from this effort. This is the centerpiece scene of the film for me. Well, and that idea, her keeping a lid on herself, is what you always describe to me leading up to me finally watching the film. You see this flood of emotions again and wave after wave across her face, sometimes changing in a split second. The terror of having to prove that she's okay, the anger that she can't act upon over this hideous betrayal, the mistrust that comes from having been sent away by the one person who should protect you, and then on top of all of that, the added insult of the doctor and Nick's mother closing in on either side of her. It felt so awful. I just wanted to choke them. But still, there's comedy. Before it's it a funny sounds, movie. Before it sounds too awful. When oh, Fred, no. It's, it's too awful. <laughs> too late to, do, to save it from that. When Fred Draper shouts, I'm not a spaghetti man, in response to the dinner menu. And then Mabel is the calming influence there. When you see her take control of it and calm him down, you think, Oh, maybe everything's going to be all right. Are you that optimistic? No, because it goes into this whole just be yourself, be yourself. Well, who the hell is that? And how is there a safe place for any of that to occur? Well, he has to say something, and I think it is just all completely driven by guilt. He cannot contain how guilty he feels and how angry he ultimately is at himself. When he is admonishing her to be herself, that's what got her sent away. And then when he asks her, how was it up there? How did that feel to you? In front of people. It's, it's awful. <laughs> it's, it's awful. I'm sorry. There's not another word. It's terrible. And she's being told to relax and be calm over and over again. Yeah, that's the most relaxing thing to do. Well, she does stand up for herself. They tried to kill what makes her Mabel, but they couldn't do it. And when she asks them to leave, she is being completely reasonable. I think the only reasonable person in the whole damn house. When he is saying this, be yourself. Do you think he is equating be yourself to be normal, quote unquote? Is that what he's going through in his mind? Because he wants normal so much because the alternative is completely exhausting. Yeah, I thought he meant you can be unusual here. It's okay. But of course it's not. None of what he's saying is true. And she is being herself by being honest and saying, my husband and I, we want to be together alone. She's honestly being herself there. It's the physical manifestation that nobody can then handle. Yeah, I'm not sure normal is possible. And I'm not even sure that being alone together is what he wants right now. And on top of all of that, it becomes very clear no one gets her. No one will stand up for her in the way that she is pleading for. This committal, it seems to have come to nothing. Right away, we understand that nothing has changed. Or is it fair to characterize it that way? Has anything changed? I think it's worse. I do think so. That's six months gone that you'll never get back. So we have to just go forward believing that tomorrow will be a better day? Sometimes that's true, I guess, and sometimes it won't be. Everything is about the moment that we have right now, though. Immediacy and spontaneity, that is the coin of the realm in Cassavetti's universe. And that's the hard truth of the film. Your average audience, I guess, is just not too keen on that. If you're being at all honest, though, that's all we can ask, just for the opportunity for hope. I guess that's why I sort of, in a way, push so hard for it to be clear in terms of a diagnosis, because I want to think that at least at some point in Mabel's life, 
she would get treated properly, whether that's medically or not, but that the time would go on and the times would catch up with her and maybe her frustrations wouldn't be the same. Right. So when I think about all the films that came in the wake of this, how long that might take, we're talking, if she can hang on for another 25 years, she might get that. In the meantime, it's not working that well. We have the kids that are protecting her. After all of this goes down, rallying around her after she's cut herself to protect her from Nick. Nick can't control any of this, and he has to understand that, but it's fruitless to expect that from him. He hits her a second time. He threatens to kill her and the kids. Now, by no means do I think he is a family annihilator, but what is the value of having him say this, though? How do you balance the weight of the effect that it will have on his family versus the relief valve of saying it and letting it go versus keeping it in and actually doing it? That's the exact word I was going to use, relief valve. I think that he does need them, and I wish that he had a different space where he could express all of that and not bring it into the family. If he had one of those rooms he could go to and smash everything <laughs> like they have nowadays and then be better Wait, at home. Where do I get one of these rooms? Yeah, they're all over the place. Well, not all over the place, but yeah, I've seen them. But it does seem to have let something go for him. He seems to have been able to calm down at that point. People like that, well, that's really all of us. We don't realize the power that our words have on others years down the road. And the worst part of it, I think, is that the simple fact of the matter is that if he had done right by her in the first place, none of this would have even happened. Now, it may be hard for some people to remember or even recognize because they were born later than this, but there weren't movies like this before Cassavetes and company came along. Something you said earlier just made me think of that. Look at the length of the takes when she is putting the kids to bed and what the camera focuses on. Then look at all the other American movies from 1974. You have some great movies in there. The Godfather Part Two, Chinatown. Oh, okay. When did The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh come out? <laughs> that was later. Oh, okay. They're excellently made films, but no one is doing this. Those are very carefully crafted products that follow a particular template. And because of the performances and the time, I certainly thought, oh, there had to be improving like crazy happening here and no there was none Cassavetes himself said the entire script was written and there were no improvisations whatsoever one thing you'll learn about him as you read more he's a liar <laughs> sometimes <laughs> he can be a bit of a carnival barker a raconteur whatever story suits the occasion I believe it for the most part I do not believe 100% Here's what I do believe. He said this about shadows, but I do think it could apply to this film and all of his films. He said, the emotion was improvisation. The lines were scripted. The attitudes were improvised. But Jenna Rollins and Peter Falk did say that they read it through many times, but they did not rehearse. And they weren't allowed to talk to each other about their characters. There's where that immediacy and spontaneity thing that I was talking about earlier comes into play in a big way. That shouldn't be confused for a lack of preparation, obviously, or complete freedom to go just anywhere. It's the appearance of improvisation, but they had to be so carefully scripted because Cassavetes knew exactly where he wanted every part of this thing to go. And the result you see on screen, that feeling like, oh, this is just made up out of whole cloth right here in front of me. I think that goes a long way towards the quality of the performances, like you said, and his implicit trust of the people that he collaborated with. So we're nearing the end. And we have our coda beginning when she asks, Do you love me? Can he begin to answer that question at that moment? Does he even know? And he doesn't answer. He doesn't say anything. It's more about putting the bed together. Because I think what he said earlier is more of his mantra. We had a tough day and we got through it. And so it's always going to be turmoil with Cassavetes. Nothing is easy. There is no value in easy. That's what resonates with me. You can attest to this. <laughs> it's yeah. a big part Who of you telling? my worldview, <laughs> too. I try to relax. I try to keep that at bay for your sake, for the sake of the people that I care about. But it always bubbles up, it feels like. I can pretend for a while, but I don't truly believe in the easy path. I don't think there's value in it. Okay, wait, 
maybe I'll make a concession. There is very little value in it, I guess, to be more precise. But it's a funny movie. See, I can compromise. <laughs> and I can relate to this story that Elaine May tells about Cassavetes and how if people liked something that he did too much, he would change it. The goal is always love, but also all of its difficulties and discomforts. So that seems like we have definitely answered the question I asked way back at the beginning. Why does he speak to you, Cole? Yeah, I've had this feeling for as long as I can remember about him. I first saw this about 20 years ago, and I can't remember the exact circumstances anymore, but I remember the shattered feeling. Now it only seems like I watch it usually when I feel my worst, which is a dodgy proposition for anyone trying to take on this film. I am rolling the dice that I can't get any lower than I feel right now, or that this may start a downward spiral from which I cannot recover. Some things you just are not ready for. Maybe you don't have the accumulated experience to be able to process it properly, but this, I am never truly ready for this, but I do it anyway. That's what Cassavetes would want. Originally, I think I wasn't ready in the sense that I had never seen something on screen that I had previously considered inexpressible in this way. Do you find it equally impossible the way I do to accurately synopsize what this film is entirely about? I do, but that's not to say that it's inaccessible somehow. I don't want people to stay away from it. I really don't. But it does ask a lot of the audience. We are expected to look at every single gesture, every expression, every word, every idea, and keep track of it the whole time, constantly questioning. I mean, if you don't, though, you're still going to get a devastating experience. One thing I wanted to ask you about before we wrap everything up here, this dichotomy of it being so cutting about sexual politics in some ways, and still being such a remarkable love story, do you find anything incongruous about that? Yes, and that's why it's realistic. <laughs> I do. Every day I struggle with some of those same questions. I'm still trying to figure it out. Probably a lot of other married people are too. The reason I think it works so well for me is something I mentioned earlier. It comes down to how much Cassavetes loves all of his characters. He makes room for everyone's faults. You just saw it in opening night. You see it in the killing of a Chinese bookie. He is so generous. There's not a character in any of these films that I don't feel for, irrespective of how unsavory or lost or damaged they are. We occasionally talk about how one of the pitfalls of genre pictures, at least contemporary genre pictures, are how hollow they feel because of a lack of stakes that are often rooted in a lack of maturity or experience. And economically that makes sense because 18 to 24 year olds make up the biggest part of the ticket buying public these days. They would obviously want to see themselves reflected in what they buy tickets for, the downside is that they are too often represented as either cliches or cannon fodder. I give the people what they want, I guess. But Cassavetti's films never do that. These are movies unmistakably made for adults. Do you think that that contributed to or was the entire reason why he was often so critically and commercially unpopular? I think it's because it literally hurts to watch these movies. If I had to just pick one reason... Most people don't want to pay for or subject themselves to that. It's odd because I'm sort of of two minds because this to me is what the 60s and 70s cinema feels like. I'm expecting something vanguard. So is this so to the extreme of that? Is he so much more challenging than Herzog or Fassbender, for example? I think in a lot of ways, those names that you mentioned are still very much clamped down. I don't see them roaming as freely technically, for instance. I think of something as button-pushing as Taxi Driver that would come along a couple years later. Even that is made like West Side Story. He's not doing things, Scorsese, technically in the same way that Cassavetes is in getting so far inside the movie as he's making it. Not to say that those films aren't all fantastic. There's just something different at play on a different level with Cassavetes for me. I totally agree with you. And I think there's something more too. I think it's maybe that focus on family stories and also having women at the center of it, whether or not they have some specific pathology, but 
showing their specific stories, maybe people just didn't want to deal with that either. Yeah, I don't even know where to start. There are so many layers to this onion. What's hard about it in this case, for instance, is the lack of modulation. And I don't mean that as a fault. I just mean that we as viewers don't often encounter something so unrelentingly demanding that starts out going full tilt and maintains that pretty much throughout the full running time and has no resolution in the way that we think of them, and expects us, like the characters, to never give up. Yeah. Every time I watch it, I feel like I've been wrung out like a rag. But this is what I love him for, though. He never lets me off the hook. You cannot coast through a John Cassavetes film. It's highly personal for me because, in a way, this is me when I look at Nick. I am this angry person. I'm probably more able to articulate what I'm generally feeling better than he is. But here's the trick. Anger makes all that articulation go out the window. It doesn't matter. Along the same lines, do you equally see yourself in some of this? Do you connect to that fear of being out of control, being considered committable? Yes, every day. (laughs) Yeah, no, that is one of my greatest fears I've heard that it can fall into some categories that you think you're either going to be committed or you end up homeless. And I do think about, yes, commitment against my will, having no choice, finally just breaking apart somehow. So it definitely rings true for me. And I would imagine that there are some adult children of extreme circumstances like this watching this film thinking, that was my family. I know it wasn't yours, but I'm assuming I know the answer to this. If the purpose is all about revealing the truth, does this portrayal of a family ring true for you? I definitely think so, for better or worse. Even though I might not have gone through these exact circumstances, I think of this in terms of us relating to it. Think of the horrifying prospect of seeing our arguments, seeing ourselves in our worst moments being staged for public consumption. Just sitting here when I say that, what do you feel like? vomiting. (laughs) And it's still not enough. Here's the thing. It's still not enough seeing that, feeling that in the pit of our stomachs to keep it from happening again at some point. That terrible feeling of being exposed in that way isn't strong enough to be a preventative. And this is what is key about connecting to Cassavetti's body of work. Being able to be honest about ourselves and how magnificent and ridiculous and terrible we are all at the same time. And it hits hard because after this was over, we didn't speak to each other that night. You went to bed. I sat in the dark for a little while. It's tough. And you mentioned he wrote this for her. This was supposed to be a play initially. Can you imagine doing this every night of the week and twice on Sundays? No. Two matinee days? No. (laughs) It's awful. So the end. I think we've covered in detail why I love it, why I chose it. This was your first time to see it. What was that experience like? You made a point earlier, and this ended up happening to me on that day. That day, I had already felt like I was eviscerated. So that's the feeling I had going into the viewing of the film. So maybe that was the best way to see it. I wasn't in some Disney dream, and then this, you know, opened up the (laughs) world for me and showed me what it was really like. It somehow was the worst moment that I could watch it and the best moment that I could watch it. Oh, one more thing I wanted to point out. One more thing. This is actually apropos. (laughs) Shout out to the Columbo whistle of this old man making an appearance. Okay, we'll move away from this a little bit. How about your recommendation? Do you have something to lift us up now after all this? No. (laughs) I'm going to keep it all in the family. Maybe if a woman under the influence spoke so strongly to you, opening night really spoke to me. And that's from 1977, also written and directed by Cassavetes with Jenna Rollins, Ben Gazzara, Joan Blondell, Paul Stewart, Zora Lampert, our favorite Ah. from Let's Scare Jessica to Death, John Toole, Laura Johnson, and Cassavetes himself. It's about the mental unraveling of a famous actress during previews for a new play she's starring in. Well, it's a common theme we've already talked about. There were tons of problems with getting this released. It wasn't even distributed until 1991. And I'll tell you, the watching of this was a puzzle for me. I was really trying to pin down and work out 
what Cassavetes was trying to say to me. I mentioned some of it to you as I was watching Yeah, it. actually, I was glad to have this conversation. It's so fun to see you have a similar struggle like I had, wrestling with this thing, being given this gift that you have to wrangle, understand, or at least come to an understanding with. Because I didn't want the story to come down to this actress is crazy or going crazy because she can't handle aging. And I did watch the super awesome brief get together with Jenna Rollins and Ben Gazzara back in 2004. It's a feature on the DVD. That helped a lot. They talked about the process. And like with all of these films, it's really about responding realistically in character within a very precise script. And she said with this character, once you watch the film, you'll understand what I'm saying. It's not about alcohol. It's not about smoking. She just didn't want to be in this play. Similar to how you don't want to be in this podcast? Is that why you're relating to this? <laughs> no, she didn't want to be in A Woman Under the Influence eight shows a week. No, she just didn't want to be bogged down in this play about the weight of aging, which is what the playwright intended, played by Joan Blondell here, who's great. And aside from her, I hope it goes without saying, but everyone here is beyond stellar. Jenna Rowland should have won every award in every festival every program, including stage and screen for this movie. She's just unbelievable. And I loved Jenna Rollins revealing that she felt like this whole car accident and the death of the young fan was all in Myrtle's mind and that everything was invented by her. So interesting to get that insight. How about you? Are we going to finally talk about Mary Poppins as a recommendation? I'm going to keep it in the family too, in a way, and recommend A Constant Forge from the year 2000. This is directed by Charles Kizliak, and here is where you go if you want anecdotes about Cassavetes. This episode could have been three plus hours of that. That's what this film is. It's a documentary about the life and work of Cassavetes made up of interviews with him but mainly also with his collaborators. This is one of those choices that illustrates the difference to me between telling someone what you think the 10 greatest films ever made are versus telling them about the 10 films that make up who you are. Is it one of the greatest films ever made? No, probably not. Is it one of the films that will help you understand me? Likely number one on that list. I think it's one of the very first things I ever showed you. I was just about to say that. (laughs) I think it was the first week, it seems like. It's long, three and a half hours, and it's not warts and all, but it does give a decently rounded picture of what it was like to live and work with and love the man most responsible with inventing American independent cinema as we know it. In spite of the lesser angels of his nature, I find it incredibly inspiring, and I hope everyone gets to see it eventually. So once again, that's two great recommendations, Opening Night and A Constant Forge. And that brings us to the end of episode 125. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new magic lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We're on Twitter, at Lantern underscore casts. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Laura Cannon at the Fatal Films Podcast. The Fine Gentleman at Fuds on Film. Josh Hornbeck in the Criterion Channel Surfing Podcast. Jeff Duncanson. Andy Wolverton. Mark Falco. Jesse Dampolo. And Rosalie Lewis. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us. Special thanks this time to RobZTV.com for leaving us a very nice rating and review on iTunes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website MagicLanternPodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 